So this afternoon's presentation is on learning from the experience of others. And uh, a, a number of uh, speakers over the last couple of days have pointed out a, a, a really important truth that we don't go to enough fires to get good at what we do by simply going to fires. And uh, I learned this early on in, in, in my career. I worked in a, in a small suburban department outside of Boston, Massachusetts, the first place that I worked. Uh, started back in 1974. And uh, there'll be a, a picture about that in a minute. But uh, I had a mentor who was a uh, chief officer in a, in a larger urban department. And uh, he invited me to come ride with him anytime he worked on a Friday. And uh, so Fridays, when I wasn't at work, I would go ride with him and uh, got an opp opportunity to observe his companies working and watching him run fires. And, uh, and when we weren't doing that, he was asking me questions and uh, challenging my thoughts about various things and so forth. And I learned a, a huge amount from him, a gentleman named Emilio Scalesi. And... Uh, so as I, I continued through my, uh, through my career, I continued to look at, at the experience of others, whether it be reading case studies that, that had been written, uh, reading uh, uh, NIOSH reports, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health reports on, on line of duty deaths. Uh, I get curious about uh, other people's incidents and sometimes I would call them up and, and ask some questions and, and ask for information. Um, uh, how many people here have seen a video of a backdraft in Lima, Peru? There's a, a elevating platform and so <laughs> forth. Pretty much everybody has seen that. Uh, well, I, uh, I was at a, a conference in uh, Valdivia, Chile, and there was a Peruvian guy there, and uh, some of you have met him, Giancarlo Fasalacqua. And uh, I said, Giancarlo, do you know anything about this incident with this backdraft in, in Lima, the one with the, with the snorkel apparatus? And, and he said, absolutely. He said, that was, that was a, 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 the snorkel from my station. And uh, he knew guys that were there and so forth. And uh, he invited me to come to Lima and visit, uh, visit uh, his, uh, his fire station and so forth. So I went down there. And one of the things I told him was, is, I want to go see this particular uh, building. And uh, it's a very long story about how that actually transpired and, and it's some, some really curious parts. But we went and we took a look at the building and I took pictures of the building. Uh, on one side of the building there was a bank and uh, as I was taking a picture of the building, the bank was also in the, in, in the picture and the police came out of the bank because uh, uh, it's illegal to take pictures of banks in Peru. And uh, so fortunately, Giancarlo managed to save me from getting arrested by the police. Uh, and then we went back to the fire station and he had invited all the guys that were still around uh, who had been at that incident to come and look at the pictures. And we brought it up on, uh, on Google Earth and drew a floor plan on the whiteboard. And we talked about the various pieces and parts and we figured out what exactly had happened. Now, what they said in the video was not entirely accurate. It wasn't a plastics factory, uh, but uh, there were some unique features of the building that uh, uh, were central to understanding what it is, what it is that happened. So it was really kind of fascinating. Uh, and I then sat down and, and over the next couple of weeks, I wrote a case study about that uh, particular incident. But if I, if I hadn't gone to Lima and talked to these guys, I never would have been able to make sense out of, out of that incident. And uh, so uh, this is kind of a continuation of that story. It's not about the fire in Belgium that's on the, on the, first, on the first slide, uh, but that's another example of how uh, we can take advantage of the technology that we have today to learn from the experience of others. Uh, I saw a video clip of this incident, and uh, I, was, I was kind of fascinated by the, by the fire dynamics that were involved, and I had a couple of questions about some of the tactics that I, that I saw being used. Uh, the guys were getting after this thing, but they were really having a difficult time with, with, the, uh, with the incident for the, at the beginning of it. And uh, so I was kind of curious about that. So uh, I, uh, I copied a link to the video and I, I saved it onto my computer and I said, you know, I know some guys from Belgium. 
And so I got onto Facebook and I fired out a thing and said, hey, does anybody know anything about this, this incident? And I put in the, in the address. I had already found the building uh, in, uh, in, in Google Maps, uh, get down into Street View, drove up and down the street until I found the building and so forth. And, and uh, in 15 minutes, I was chatting online with the first in-company officer. 15 minutes. Um, that's kind of interesting. He, he clued me into a whole bunch of things. It explained a lot about what it was that I was seeing that I would have maybe not guessed looking at the, looking at the video. Some other things he confirmed some things that I, that I suspected were the case. Uh, but it was, it was really was pretty interesting. And then I turned this into a, a uh, short case study uh, for the people that, uh, that I work with. So that's what we're going to talk about is, is the, the, the process of doing that and what kinds of information uh, I, I, uh, it's built around a series of questions. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that and how may, that might be a useful technique for each of us to use uh, if we're trying to share uh, experience of others with, uh, with the people that we work with. So a little bit, of, little bit about me. Um, uh, I've been in the fire service for officially being paid as a member of the fire service for a little over 43 years. Uh, as I shared with the, the folks that were here the first night, I uh, went to my first fire when I was six weeks old, didn't have any choice in the matter. Um, uh, so I kind of grew, grew up in the firehouse uh, and then continued that on with my, uh, with my uh, uh, joining, the, joining the family business. I didn't work in the same department as my dad, but we, uh, we shared, a, shared a profession. Um, so a, a couple of pictures that, that kind of point to some, uh, so, some little, little bit of uh, in, information about myself. Uh, that's a picture of me before I had a mustache. <laughs> One of the few in captivity. Uh, that's my, uh, my, my daughter, Heather. She's, uh, she's 42. Not in that picture. Uh, uh, that was probably the first, maybe the second year that I was working in the fire service. Uh, and uh, again, started on the job in Concord, Massachusetts, little suburban community. I've had the opportunity to work at several different fire agencies in, in the United States. Uh, I worked as a, as a firefighter. I get promoted to captain. I changed departments, took a job as a fire chief. Uh, then I went to our National Fire Academy, kind of the, the, the similar to the, to the MSB Academy, uh, and uh, joined a local volunteer fire department. So I went from being a paid fire chief to being a volunteer firefighter, so I get to ride backwards. Uh, and uh, then did a little bit of work in the, in the petrochemical industry, training uh, fire brigades and, and hazmat teams. And I went to the city of Gresham in Oregon and uh, then get laid off. The city fell on hard financial times. They decided they didn't need a training division anymore. Uh, so I get laid off and I fortunately ended up uh, on, uh, on Whidbey Island. Um, the picture on the right is when I was working in, working in Gresham. Uh, Wired Magazine, I don't know, some of you may be familiar with it. Wired Magazine did a little uh, article on uh, uh, Innovations in firefighting, and, and uh, uh, I'm not sure how they get hooked up with me, but they uh, they came and, and uh, spent the, spent the day with us and uh, and watched some uh, watched some live fire training in the container and so forth. Um, down on the bottom, that's where I'm going to be next month. I'll be in Argentina working with uh, some of my Argentinian brothers uh, on uh, on a uh, uh, regional live fire training uh, course that they're uh, that they're putting on down there. Uh, and uh, the picture in the middle uh, is, uh, is me at work today. Um, uh, we're so, sort of unique among American fire departments in that, in that we have a rather strange looking headgear uh, that we, we wear. It doesn't seem strange to you, but it does certainly seem strange to all of our, all of our colleagues uh, around us. Uh, and then lastly, uh, in kind of people ask me, what do I do for fun? And uh, uh, for most of my life, what I did for fun is I went to work uh, and, and still do. Um, uh, but four and a half years ago, uh, excuse me. Anyway, we'll, we'll move on. Um, Central Whidbey Island Fire and Rescue, we're located in Washington, Washington State. That's in the uh, upper left-hand corner, uh, left corner of the uh, of the United States. 
And uh, we are kind of in sort of the upper left-hand corner of Washington State. We're in between uh, Seattle and uh, uh, Victoria, British Columbia, kind of midway in between the two. In fact, if you stand on the western shores of Whidbey Island, you can, you can see Canada. Uh, and if you're not careful, you'll hook up to a Canadian cell tower and your cell phone bill will go through the roof. Um, <laughs> Our district covers the middle of Whidbey Island. Whidbey Island is the second, uh, second largest island in the continental United States. Uh, it's uh, about 60 miles long. And uh, so we have the, the middle third of that. Uh, it's kind of weird. There's five fire departments on Whidbey Island, uh, three fire districts, the city of Oak Harbor, and uh, Battalion 3 of uh, uh, Naval Region Northwest Fire and Emergency Services. They protect the military base. So we're the, we're the, uh, we, we cover the area in the middle of the island. So it's an island in Puget Sound. Uh, just basically two ways to get there. You can take a boat or you can drive to the north end of the island and take a bridge. Um, we're a combination department. We have full-time employees, part-time employees, and volunteers. Uh, we operate from three stations and cover about 129 square kilometers. Uh, predominant risks are private dwellings and small, small commercial buildings. So a, a typical uh, rural community in, in, in the United States, except for the fact that we're on an island. Um, that's home. When I, uh, when I check in on Facebook and I'm at my house, those of you that are friends with me have seen that, uh, it says center of the universe. I really believe that to be true. Um, so I'll make a connection between uh, these case studies and a, a program called Blue Card. Um, Blue Card is a, uh, a training and certification program for incident commanders of, of local incidents. Uh, in the United States, we have uh, 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 incidents are typed. Type five incidents are ones that you handle with your own agency. Type four incidents are where you invite your friends, uh, close friends, physically close friends, neighbors. Uh, and uh, uh, type three incidents are typically incidents that are handled on a state level. Uh, type two and type one incidents tend to be uh, incidents that are, that are managed by a, a federal uh, or state emer uh, incident management team. Uh, large, large uh, types of incidents with, with tremendous amounts of resources. So uh, Blue Card is compatible with uh, our federal uh, national incident management system, but it's really focused on developing competence of uh, incident commanders that deal with those uh, type five and type four incidents at the, uh, at the local level that, that aren't quite so complex, uh, that, that are a little bit faster moving and, uh, and, and require some specific expertise. So how this works is, is the initial training is a 50-hour online training program and then a three-day, 24-hour uh, simulation laboratory. Uh, and typically, I know that the, uh, the sim lab that I went to, we had 10 participants in the simulation lab. So over the course of three days, uh, we did uh, 100 short simulations in five different building types, ranging from uh, single family homes to big box stores. Now there's a three year recertification cycle to maintain your qualification within the, within the system. Uh, and the way that we do that is we use quarterly online and, and simulation training. But, but again, that's still, that's once every three months and that's probably an opportunity to do one or two simulations. So I was looking for a way to engage with people who are certified ICs, also with people who maybe aren't certified ICs, but might from time to time end up sitting in the right front seat of the, of the fire apparatus uh, and might be the first arriving person at a, at a fire in a building or some other, some other type of emergency. So this focuses on uh, IC number one in the, yeah, yeah, that's one of yours, John. Uh, IC number one who shows up in a, in a fire engine or IC number two shows up in the fire SUV. And uh, this is actually from uh, the uh, IFIW presentation that John and I did on, on Blue Card in Belgium. Uh, one of the, the interesting things that I, I, I'm kind of curious about 
uh, with this system is, could you take somebody from a different agency who had never worked with your people and just kind of plug them into one of these IC number one or number two roles and have them actually be able to make sense out of what goes on at an emergency incident in your community? And uh, so John and I kind of joked that it would be interesting to kind of kind of magically transport one of, of the New South Wales folks or one of our folks and kind of plug them into, into, this, uh, into this system and see how does that work. Uh, those of you that met Chief Jason Coy from Laramie County Fire District 2, uh, his agency and my agency are sister districts. So we have a, a formalized collaborative relationship where one of the things that we do is at least once a year we swap employees, we swap members. And uh, last year I sent my training captain to work for him for a week and he sent his to work for me. And uh, uh, when his train, I picked his training ca uh, captain up at the, uh, at the airport and I said, just so you know, our training captain works as a command officer. Uh, here's the keys to his fire SUV. Um, you're expected to go on calls and oh, by the way, if you're the first command officer that gets there, you're it. <laughs> He got a little bit pale, and uh, he, did, he didn't end up getting first to, to anything, but uh, by the time we get done, we were reasonably certain that he would have done, uh, he would have done a pretty credible job. Uh, our training captain uh, get put in the fire engine, and uh, again, he didn't get any significant jobs, but, uh, but again, we were pretty convinced that uh, uh, by the time we get to the end that they would have been able to, to kind of plug and play, and we're, we're looking forward to that. We've got... We've got the, the, uh, the folks that are gonna do this next year kind of identified. So again, kind of a neat system because it gives a very consistent way for us to uh, approach the process of, of managing emergency incidents. So the question is, how do, we, how do we increase competence? If we don't go to fires all that often, and you know, when we look at, at the, the process of, of simulation, that takes, a, that takes a fair bit of work. Uh, again, we do it once a quarter, uh, and we try and get people through each of the five building types every five quarters and, uh, and rotate through that on a, on a three-year cycle so everybody gets exposed to, to everything again and again and again. We also do uh, feedback on performance at actual, em actual emergency incidents, reviewing audio tape and, and, uh, and other documentation. Uh, but one of the things that I discovered is that firefighters watch video of other people's incidents. Now, to what end? Why do you think they do that? Okay, it, it, it's interesting. You know, you get, it, it's a fire. You get to see what other people are doing, how they approach things. Okay, it might be because we don't, we don't see that many fires. So again, that raises the interest level. Steve? Yeah, maybe other tactics, and, 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 one of the, and one of the things with that, and, and usually I, I kind of intervene a little bit when I discover this going on, because sometimes it's, it's so that we can, you know, engage in a little downward social comparison. We say, man, they're messed up. <laughs> and I say, you know, keep in mind that when we watch a video, we've got one view from typically from one location. Occasionally I get really excited because the, the videographer actually goes around and gets us a 360 of the building and focuses on the interesting stuff and the like, but a lot of times it's a static view from one uh, particular position. Now the other thing that we don't know is we don't know, well, well, what was their water supply? We don't know, well, what was around the other side of the building? We don't know what kind of fire agency was this? What, what, what was their staffing? What were their resources? We oftentimes don't know that if all we're doing is we're just going to YouTube and type in pre-arrival fire so that you get to see before they get there or, or even better house fire or something, you know, plethora of video comes up. So I think sometimes there's, some, there's value that comes out of it, particularly if we engage our brain when we're watching this video. But I think a lot of the time it's, it, it's just simply, you know, we, we watch it because it's fun, it's, it's amusing, and, and, you know, really don't get as much educational value out of, out of it as we might. It does take a little bit of effort. 
So I started to ask myself, how can we use incident video to increase depth of knowledge and competence in decision making? How can we do that? Is there a way? So, hello, you were right, John. Yeah. So I came up with this idea called 10 minute training. Now, everybody that works for me will tell you that that is a lie. Nobody has ever been able to do one of these in 10 minutes. Uh, but the reason why it's called 10 minute training is, is the front end of this focuses on the responsibility of the first arriving company officer as an incident commander, what they're going to communicate to their crew, what they're going to communicate and what they're going to communicate to dispatch and their initial radio report, follow up report and their orders to the next driving company. Now that should not take longer than 10 minutes because we've got drive time to the incident, we've got arrival, we've got a couple of radio transmissions. That should be able to be done in 10 minutes. Now, there's some follow-on stuff, which might take another 10 minutes, or 20, or 30, or an hour and a half, depending upon how engaged people get in that. But the front end of it only should take about 10 minutes. So the things that 10 minute training focuses on is conversations and thought process that's pre-arrival. You get dispatched on this call. Well, let's back up. When does size up begin? When does our, our process of situational assessment begin? Peter says when we walk in the station. W which day? The first day? Every day's a training day. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a key thing because part of this reinforces the importance of knowing your patch, paying attention when you're out and about. You know, our guys, the, the predominant call that we respond on, the most frequent type of call, John talked about his, uh, ours happens to be medical incidents involving people that fell down. So I think we have a higher level of gravity on Whidbey Island, that and the fact that the median age in, in, in my district is about 58. So um, uh, old, older people, at least in America, tend to fall down. And uh, on Whidbey Island, it's enhanced by this, this gravitational pull. But uh, um, when, when people go out on a medical call, what also should they be paying attention to? The house, the hydrants in the area, or if there's exposures around, access issues, and everything between that incident location and the fire station, both probably on the way back mostly. On the way there, they should sterile cab, they should be focused on the call. But on the way back, pay attention. Come back a different way than the way that you went. Look at other things. So again, these 10 minute trainings help people build an understanding of why that might be important to that initial incident commander. So once we get dispatched, then we start to take all of this accumulation of knowledge that we've had about our patch and we start it to put it in the context of what kind of a call that I get dispatched to. Am I going to a house fire? Am I going to an apartment fire, a commercial fire? What part of town is it, is it in? Is there a water supply? Is there not a water supply? What other kind of issues might there be? Or maybe it's not a fire. Maybe it's a car into a building. Or maybe it's a, a report of an unconscious person. Or maybe it's some other kind of thing. So what are the key elements of context and what conversations are we going to have with the members of our crew on the way to the call? Are we going to make any assignments before we get there? Now, I, I know that, that my friend Raymond, it, it's what seat you're sitting in. What number firefighter are you in the, in, in the major pump? Uh, in other cases, the assignments are made on the fly. Again, one of the challenges for us, depending on whether you're a career staff or an on-duty staff, resource or a volunteer staff resource the on-duty staff resource they can say in the morning okay you're going to drive you're the you're the hydrant guy this is the officer we have three people very fairly straightforward uh, for the volunteer staff resources they know how many people they they're going to have after they're done so it may be that uh First guy that gets here, he's sitting in the driver's seat. We have a rule, nothing responds with less than one guy. Um, if there's two, there's different assignments. If there's three, there's different assignments. If there's four, which is rare, 
there's different assignments. So they're going to need to make their assignments on the way to the call. I mean, other than who's driving, that's pretty obvious. Self-evident. Uh, initial radio report. Well, one of the things in blue card is that the uh, initial incident action plan is communicated as a part of the uh, initial radio report. So that's where the company that has arrived first communicates, we're here, this is what we have, and it's in a very specific way. Um, this is what we're doing. This is the strategy that we're operating in, offensive or defensive. Uh, they establish a name command so that we, we have a, a designated name for the incident. And then what their resource determination is. Do they need more help? Are they good with what's coming? Uh, and then the next piece of that is out and either do a 360 or report that you were unable to do so and if you couldn't, why? Then we want them to give orders to the next arriving company because again, this part of this is about prioritizing what's important. Uh, for us, because we have very limited staffing, it's about what, are, what is the most important thing to do? Let's do that. What is the next most important thing to do? Then we'll do that. Uh, it's a little different. If you have resources piling in and they're all going to be there fairly quickly, you still need to prioritize sequence but it's more of a coordination issue because you're going to do more than one thing at a time. For us, it's kind of one thing at a time. And then once we get through that, that's the 10 minute piece. If you can't do that in 10 minutes, you probably shouldn't be in the right front seat. Then there's other learning opportunities, as we'll see in the example that, uh, that I'm going to show you. And then, and then the, the, the last part of this is we're going, to, we're going to kind of do a little bit of this on the fly. Uh, and, uh, and take a look at, uh, at, at some of the tools that are available to help us provide some depth beyond the video that we found on YouTube. No, I'm good. I can always reach over. So anyway, this, we, we distribute these in the form of a, of a, of a PDF uh, document. And uh, you'll note that there's two logos up on the top. There's ours, and then there's some other logo to the, to the right of that. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the logo for South Whidbey Fire EMS. They're the district to the south of us. And uh, we've established a collaborative training relationship with them. Uh, we keep trying to make it stronger. Sometimes there's challenges with that, but we try and make it stronger. Uh, and one of the things was is to try and come up with a, a kind of a common framework for uh, training materials so that they could be shared with, with, with both agencies. So that's, uh, that's why both, both logos are on there. And uh, again, the, the video provides kind of limited context. So we found that there's a variety of other things that might be handy if we want to make this a useful training tool. So one of them is a map. Uh, including water supply. Now, if you go to Google Maps, it does not show you where the hydrants are. Uh, so when it comes to that, uh, it's easier in the United States than it is in, in, in Belgium, for example, because in the United States, hydrants stick up out of the ground. So if you go to Google Street View, you can drive around and you can find them. Uh, in fact, there was one incident that we did a case on that uh, we were, I was watching the video and it was a rather long video. It was a, a, a flammable liquid truck that was on, on fire on the freeway. And they were trying to find hydrants. And uh, they, they were having some difficulty in sorting out their water supply. And it was pretty interesting because I managed to find like 15 hydrants in the area before they did. Uh, just simply by driving around in, in Google Earth and, and, uh, uh, or in Street View and... and, and, and seeing them sticking up out of the ground. Again, the IC was busy, you didn't have time to do that, but, but for me it was pretty easy. Um, aerial photographs. is one of the things we frequently don't see in the video is what's, you know, what's around the building that's on fire and how close is it. Um, views of the building on all sides when it wasn't on fire. This is the observations that maybe you would have had when you were driving around your patch. Uh, video capture on arrival. So what I do is I do a screenshot of a full screen video and I put that in there because uh, again I want this to be easily usable whether you've got a, a, a good video connect or a good uh, internet connection or not. So if you can't look at the video at least here's what the conditions were on arrival. Um, 
Sometimes there's other incident photos while the incident was going on. Uh, again, if you know where it is and you start to poke around, oftentimes you can uncover all kinds of other things about the incident. And then also sometimes post incident photos so that we can see how did this turn out. Uh, you know, is the building still there? Was it a smoking hole in the ground? Uh, you know, was there extension to other buildings? Sometimes if the building's significantly damaged, you can, you can get a view of, of kind of construction features that might have been, have been an issue as we'll, as we'll see. So I start off with, with simply taking a, taking a screenshot of the, uh, of, the, of the Google map and I add a couple of things. I, I add a uh, orientation to north uh, because sometimes in the, in the photographs, aerial photographs and the like, it makes more sense to turn the building around and look at it from the orientation of the, quote, the front of the building as opposed to uh, north being at the top. So I try and orient that. Uh, I add fire hydrants. I put a little flame logo on the, uh, on the building that was involved in a fire, and then I add a, uh, uh, a distance. Uh, there's distance in the Google map, but it's on a, it's on, usually it's not in the part of the map I want to look at, so I just cut that out and I make a, I make a, uh, I make a, a, distance, char a distance graph on there uh, so that they have a sense of how far away are the hydrants, how far away are the other buildings and the like. So then I use an aerial photograph, and, and, and again, depending upon where this is, sometimes the quality of the aerial photograph is really good, sometimes it's not so good. Uh, but then what I'll do is I'll add some uh, other designations so that, uh, that we can make sense uh, and orient ourselves as to what's going on. So in this particular, uh, in this particular incident, we, uh, we designate the, the street side of the building or the address side of the building as Alpha, and then clockwise, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. And in this particular case, there were a series of different occupancies inside this, inside this building. So there was a, a market and a diner, and, and they shared a common uh, roofoid. And then there was a firewall. This is a masonry wall that came all the way through the roof. And there was a, a, a nail salon, a hair salon, and some apartment units in that, uh, in that back corner. Uh, and then an, another commercial occupancy on the other side. Uh, so try to give people an orientation to what kind of businesses are here because you really have to focus closely on the video in order to be able to make sense of what this is all about. So then I do uh, pictures of the building from all, all different sides or all the sides that I can get access to. And occasionally I'll, I'll note important building features on this, uh, on this drawing. Now you can't necessarily tell this, all of this, by just looking at the picture. You might suspect those things, but again, if this was in my patch, maybe we had done a pre-plan inspection or fire prevention inspections and the like, or we'd been there on calls before and we had paid attention, we might have picked up on some of these things. For example, we went on a uh, uh, water leak at a commercial occupancy in, in Coopville, which is one of the, one of the towns, that we, towns that we protect, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And when we were there, the leak was from a pipe that was located in the, in the roof ward. And uh, so while we were there, I had each one of the firefighters that was on the, on the company, I had them stick their head up through the scuttle hole into the, into the roof ward and have a look around because if we had to come back there for a fire, how the roof was constructed and the nature of that void space would be significant. Now, if I hadn't happened to be there, I was in the neighborhood and stopped by to visit with them. If I hadn't been there, they might not have done that. I would hope that they would, but they might not have. So I asked, I asked them, I said, go ahead, have a look. What's up there? So in this case, I identified that there's, a, there's an overhang with a void space, there's a common cock loft or roof void, uh, and then there's a firewall separating these other occupancies that became significant in this, uh, in this event. And that overhang continued around two sides of the building. Again, also a pretty significant thing. Now, on the back side, one of, the, one of the challenges with this is that I have absolutely no control over where the little car with the Google camera goes. 
uh, when they drive around and they make Street View. Uh, I, I, I wish I did uh, because I'd have them go down all these alleys behind buildings and things like that, but they, they don't, oftentimes don't do that. So there's an unnamed alley, alley that runs down behind the building. This is the building right here that the fire was in. Uh, but what I did do is I was able to get a, uh, a view uh, from the aerial uh, photography that showed kind of what was up with, with the back of the building a little bit. Again, not as good as, a, not as, good as I would like, uh, but it was the best that was available. And then it, this is the, uh, the, the side of the building that's on the other side of the firewall. We can see that coming through the roof and then the, and then the apartments on the, other, uh, on the other side. Now, I wanted to get pictures inside the building. And, you know, when you think about that, okay, how would I find pictures inside of a building that had a fire in it? Well, I couldn't find pictures of the roof void. So I found a similar building uh, that, that was in an article about roof voids. And uh, so I included that and I identified that this was representative. This wasn't a, the exact uh, inside of the building. Um, but one of the things that I, that I was able to do is I was able to get pictures of the inside of both the restaurant and the uh, market, the market where the fire was in the restaurant, which was the closest exposure. Um, I searched for the websites of the two businesses and lo and behold, they did, didn't they have pictures of the inside of their occupancies uh, that showed some of the obstacles to host line advancement, some of the issues with the ceiling. Uh, and so forth. So again, just by one of my firefighters refers to it as creepy stalking behavior. Uh, but if you poke around, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, I was looking at an apartment building. I was curious about the floor plan of the apartments. So I went to the website of the apartment complex and lo and behold, if they didn't have sample floor plans of their units. Condominium complex, I wanted to see the inside of that. So there's a, a, a website in the United States called Zillow. It's a, it's a real estate website. Lo and behold, if, there, if the unit that had the fire hadn't been for sale and there were pictures of the inside of the unit. So again, all kinds of interesting things that we can find if we poke around a little bit. So then we set the context for their response. So and this is kind of long, but I'll hit the, hit the highlights of what this is about. This pretty much is the same or very similar every single time. Uh, you're responding as the company officer or AIC, which is acting in capacity. That's a firefighter who's riding the right front seat. Uh, the first arriving engine, you have a crew of three. Dispatch information indicates a, a, a uh, that should be a commercial fire uh, at 4031 147th Street in uh, Midlothian, Midwest Meat Market. You're responding from the east on 147th. Second engine with staffing level of two will arrive within four minutes and a command officer will arrive two minutes later. Now there's, there's some significance to these numbers. Uh, one of them is, is that's fairly representative of our staffing. Two or three people on the fire engine, command officer, we, we have a, a duty command officer 24 hours a day that's gonna, gonna be coming on this call. But the other significance is, is we have, we have a, a uh, standard operating guideline that says until, unless you have, sort of like the Swedes, if you have five people, you can go inside. Two in, two out, incident commander, it being one of the two in, and, uh, and the pump operator. Once the command officer gets there, the number goes to six. Two in, two out, pump operator, and IC number two. So that's why we built this around six. There's more people coming to this call, but that first in company officer is probably gonna be responsible for their own crew and maybe the next driving company. Command officer gets there, command transfer, and then, the, and then IC number two runs, run, runs the, rest of the rest of the deal. So the first two questions are pretty much always the same unless, unless we do a series, like in this particular fire, there was so much good stuff. I, th I did three 10 minute trainings on this one fire because there was just so much good stuff. It was like an hour of video and it was, I just, I said, Bob, we, we need to get more out of this. But the first one and, and most all of them begin the same way. What critical factors would you consider when you're dispatched and during response, what conversation would you have with your crew? 
And uh, again, this is to try and focus them on what should we be talking about on the way to the call. Sterile cab, it should not be what we did last weekend. It should be about the call that we're responding to. Water supply locations, familiarity with the building, things of that sort. Uh, any assignments you'd make with the crew. And, and again, we sometimes switch up the staffing. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's four. So they have to think about what assignments would I make if I hadn't made them at the beginning of shift. Now, in this particular case, the video picks up in the middle of the call. Companies are already there, they're already doing work, so I don't have conditions on arrival. So I needed to make a simulation photo of the conditions that it sounded like they, they, they had. So one of, the, one of the good things with that is that they had pretty good description given in the, in, the, in the press and a couple of other things about conditions that they had on arrival, where the fire was, where they saw the flames, what kind of smoke conditions and the like. So I was able to work up a simulation photo that was, I think, reasonably accurate. Now they have to do their initial radio report. And again, one of the things with this is that, that we encourage them either to say it out loud exactly as they would do it or to take a, take a pencil and write it down. Write down exactly what you would say on the radio. And uh, they don't like doing that. Uh, they'd rather just think about it. They don't want to say it out, particularly if anybody else is around. Uh, but again, they're going to have to do that on, a, on an actual incident. So we encourage them to, encourage them to do that. Writing it down has added value because now you can look at it and you can see what it is that you, you, would, you would say. You can cross out any words that are extra BS that don't really belong in there uh, and you can tighten up the quality of your, uh, of your initial radio report. Um, and then what specific actions did you take as a company officer immediate on arrival and exiting the apparatus? Most of the time that's going to be, well, I would get a 360. In this particular instance, the building is a little bit big. They might not get a 360. They might go look around the backside. They may not go down to the other side of that firewall. But again, that would need to be communicated as an exception in their, in their follow-up report. So... Again, the same thing, state the update report. Write it down. Take a look and see, do you have any extra BS in there? Uh, we have a rule that if when you're doing simulations, you, you use the words at this time, you have to put a dollar in the jar. That's the, that's the fine because it, wh when, when else would it be? So we try and, and get them to eliminate that, that extra, extra filler uh, yakking that goes on in the radio. Um, once you've done this 360, once you've got the rest of the information, would you modify the assignments given to your crew? If so, state the task orders. What would you have them do? Instead of going here, you're going to have them go to someplace else. Um, what tactical assignment would you give the next company? Provide the TLO order. TLO is task location and objective. That's the format that we use for giving tactical orders. Now we have some additional some additional learning. This doesn't fit in the 10 minutes. Uh, we might have them watch a particular part of the video. Uh, so one of the, one of the questions we're asking here is, is what potential challenges would you anticipate gaining access and establishing fire control in this incident? And we have them take a look at the, at the operations that the, uh, the companies were, uh, were, were performing. And then after getting an aligned into the main fire occupancy, what would be the next most critical task uh, or critical attack position needs to be covered? And we tell them, don't forget the common cockloft. The fire's going up. It's going to go someplace. Think about, uh, think about where that might be. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a, just a little bit of the, uh, of the video so you can get a sense of, of kind of how we're using that uh, in, this, uh, in this particular instance. So we've got a, uh, um, crap. Stop.
So you can see that they've, uh, they've broken out the glass and extended their hose line through this front door. Fire's down here on the, down here on the left. Door where the, where the fire was located was actually covered over with a sheet of plywood that was screwed on. So anyway, just to give you a little quick flavor of that, um, there we go. Uh, so one of the challenges that they ran into was that they were they were dealing with a with a commercial building, not a house. I suspect that the people that responded to this call, just like my agency, responds to more house fires than they do commercial fires. Commercial doors are a little bit different than residential doors. They seem to have some struggles with with this. Uh, now, when I when I did this with with my guys, we'll see if you if if you can if you can pick up on this. Um, and they and they saw that they had broken the glass and extended their hose line through the through the uh, through the opening after breaking the glass. What do you think their first concern was? John knows. Yeah, door control because if you can't unbreak glass, and we have this, the same non-negotiables that John has, and one of those is is to control the control the the, the flow path until you get until you get fire control. So uh, they were quite concerned about that. These guys weren't thinking about that. They were making another opening in the building on the on the Bravo side, that left side. Uh, in again, that one would have been difficult to open and control it simply because of, of the way that it was uh, the way that it was boarded up and so forth but again getting guys to think about what is the relationship between fire dynamics and forcible entry because we tell them that there's two things at the center of everything related to firefighting one of them is is building instruction the other one's fire behavior so um, as they go through this we try and make as many connections as we can uh, to those two to those two topics so, again, we're running a little bit late, so we won't, uh, uh, we, won't, we won't take a look at this piece of video. But again, another question, they stretched the line down to where the guy was trying to open that door on the side of the building uh, and uh, began to, to attack the, the, the fire that was showing from the eaves at that location. And we wanted to think about whether that would be effective given the construction of this building. And why or why not? Uh, we then have them look at another segment and look at how the building smoke, air track, heat, and flame indicators change over a period of time from the beginning of the, of the video to four minutes into the video. And they change significantly. Uh, so we're asking them to tell us about what's going on with the fire in this case. Now we don't ask these questions until after they've made their tactical decisions because I don't want them to get into a big uh, process of analysis of what's going on. I want them to be able to recognize, recognize critical factors and act on those. But I want this to be in the back of their head. This needs to be some kind of an automatic process. So when we get done, then we talk about it. So tools that are available to us when we, when we, when we build these Usually it starts off with YouTube videos and, and uh, pretty much every day uh, I go onto YouTube and I type in pre-arrival fire in the last day. Hmm, let's see what's here. And if there's something interesting, I just copy the URL and I, I save it on my computer. And uh, later on I'll go back and I'll fiddle around with it unless I get really excited. Uh, and then I might work on it right then. Um, then it's a matter of finding the address in Google Maps. And sometimes that's easy because the person that shot the video put a description and included the address. That's not a challenge. Uh, other times, 
I know what city it's in because I saw the name on the side of the fire engine or something like that. Uh, occasionally I can see a house number uh, and that, that's, where the, that's where the crafty, creepy stalking behavior get, gets, gets involved. Um, because if I, if I don't have the location of the building, then I start to look for other indicators. Is there any place in the video there's a street sign? Is there a business across the street? Search on the name of the business. Uh, go to the county assessor's website and search on the house number. Because a lot of times I can, I can find where, okay, there's 25 places in this city that have the same house number. Okay, put each of those addresses into, into, into Google Maps, go to Street View, look at the house. Is, yeah, is that, is that one it? Um, sometimes the, the city or the county has a, has a, 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 a web accessible GIS program. Sometimes they'll have hydrant locations there and other kinds of data. Uh, online news, type in whatever kind of a fire it was and the address or the date, and the location, and see what kind of news stories pop up. Other times stuff pops up on people's Facebook feed. Um, there's also occasionally incident reports, but that's not usually for incidents that happened like yesterday. That's for incidents that happened a while ago. But if those exist, then I'll use those as well to provide a little bit more meat to the, to the, to the story. Uh, so in the last five minutes, I thought that I would uh, uh, kind of give you a, a quick look at, at how, how this might work. Uh, so there's a little bit of uh, video here. So here we've got a uh, here we've got a, a house fire. It looks like it's in a manufactured home, double wide manufactured home, uh, with a fairly substantial amount of fire involving one end of this. We had a fire very similar to this like, like three weeks ago, um, and this is before the fire department gets there. So I can stop this. Pretty much anywhere along the line, usually what I'll do is I'll continue it until the first engine shows up, then I'll just back up a couple of frames and stop. So it's showing them exactly what the, what the troops saw when they, uh, when, they, when they showed up. So if we go back to here, Now I cheated a little bit. I already went and looked this place up. Hello. Uh, okay. I understand. That's what I was afraid of. Apparently it doesn't like Google Maps. Uh, that's possible. Let's see. Could be. It's looking better. Could be, could be. So we've got a uh, we've got a map of the location. We can uh, zoom in to Street View, so we can see a little bit about what this uh, what this patch looks like. So it looks like there's mostly manufactured homes. <coughs> so again, that's kind of the that's kind of the, the 
process that I use at the beginning of, of building one of these is to is to first get have a look have a look at the video, see what goes on, think a little bit about what lessons uh, can be can be extracted from that particular particular incident because that's going to drive the questions on the back end of this. Um, then I'll find the uh, find the location and begin to gather some intel on that. Uh, I'll start off with the map. Then I'll go to the aerial aerial photograph and grab a shot of that. Have a look at that. Get down into street view. Drive around. Find the fire hydrants. Plot them on the map and get some views of whatever sides of the building I can get a view of. If I can't, I'll try and do a 3D view if the, if the quality's okay. And, uh, and, then, and then I'll do a search on the, the, the community, in this case, house fire, the date that the incident occurred or the date range, if it's not real clear where, where the, where, what, the, what the date was, and see what else I can find out about it. Because when I, when I build the case, you know, Lars and I were talking about this uh, two nights ago, and uh, on one hand, it doesn't make any difference what really happened. We can use the visual images, and that can be very useful. Uh, but what I try and do with this is I try and give them a sense, since they're going to watch what the people were doing, and what they were doing is based on what they knew about this incident. So I try and put it in as, as realistic a context as possible so that so when the folks are, are, are looking at this, they can, they can kind of make sense out of, gee, they did this. Oh, well, that's because they had persons reported. Or, gee, you know, they did that because they, you know, they had this other problem. So um, I find it to be particularly useful for myself because I learn a huge amount every time I make one of these, and I do one a week. Um, and... Uh, I think for the guys that really fully engage with them, they get a lot. Some people do. Uh, other people simply watch the video, uh, kind of what they were doing before, except I find lots of video for them. Uh, and other people read the questions and they think about it, and that's kind of intermediate, intermediate value. Uh, so these go out to everybody in our organization, uh, the people in South Whidbey Fire EMS, the people in Laramie County Fire District 2, uh, and uh, a couple of other people that have sent me an email and said, uh, add me the list. Uh, so I've got over a hundred of these. I've been doing this, uh, I've been doing this for, uh, over a year. And, uh, I think it's a, I think it's a, a pretty useful tool because if, if guys are going to watch fire video anyway, I'd rather they, I'd rather they get some value out of it. And... Probably about every, every two or three months, I try and fold one in of a fire that is not in the United States um, because I just want to get people thinking about the fact that physics is physics. Just because somebody's fire engine looks different than yours, maybe they wear a different kind of, well, they probably wear the same kind of helmet as our guys, uh, uh, that uh, there's still things that we can learn from that. And uh, I know from, from working with John and Carol, I know they use lots of video uh, from the United States. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in some cases it's for good things. In other cases it's, it's that premise that everybody in life has a purpose, even if it's to serve as a bad example. Uh, so um, think about that if that's a useful tool for you. I would suggest that maybe you, you make some of those if you decide you're going to start making those and sharing them. Uh, with your folks, shoot me an email. I'd, I'd like to get them as well because they, they might be useful for me. Uh, and if anybody would, would like to get added to the list when I send these out every week, I would be happy to put you on the, on the email list and, and send them out. So thanks for, thanks for being here. And uh, I finished with 60 seconds to spare. <laughs>